Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming, and thank you for allocating two hours from your morning today. I'm Alexia Yasunos. I'm an associate attending biostatistician in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. This course has previously been taught by my chair, Colin Beck, and um, most of the slides and the material were provided by him. So today we will try to cover the new NIH rules for grant submissions, what is meant by the terms reproducibility, replicability, rigor, and transparency. We will cover the definitions and um, why the scientific community is concerned about these issues. What do you need to do to address these issues in a grant application? And what are the implications for publishing your research findings? How should this influence how you perform your scientific research and how you document things? So there are, um, these rules are updated uh, often and there are links and websites that uh, can help you with specific questions. They also have um, frequently asked questions, which type of grants, what type of requirements. In the biostatistics, we have uh, grants management specialists and they help us with this depending on the grant that we apply. In general, if you don't have somebody in your department, you can get help from the Grants and Contracts Central Office research and technology management. <clears throat> so let's start with the, the terminology. The terms replicability and reproducibility are frequently used interchangeably to mean two different related phenomena. They have, there are many publications that uh, define these things in different ways, but today uh, we will use the NSF definitions of these terms. So reproducibility is the study's results are reproducible if the data summaries and statistical analysis performed are calculated correctly and without error. In the NSF definitions, this term is defined in the context of the reporting and analysis of the data. In practice, the term is used much more loosely to encompass what we will refer to as replicability. Another way of thinking about it, and this is the way I think about it, is that you are trying to duplicate the prior study using the same materials, the same data, the same methods. Replicability, on the other hand, is the ability of a researcher to duplicate the conclusions of a prior study by repeating the experiment and collecting new data. So now you have to duplicate the results of a prior study if you use the same procedures, but with new data. A study is reported transparently if all inferential critical steps taken in the design, contact, and analysis of the study are reported fully and accurately. So I will show you a diagram in a little bit that connects all these terms, but note that reproducibility is enhanced by transparency, that you can only reproduce the findings if you know all the technical details of the original data processing and analysis steps reported. So what is RECOR? Rigor is when a study is scientifically rigorous if it is designed and conducted in a valid manner to critically evaluate and, if necessary, refute the hypothesis under investigation. Replicability is enhanced by the quality and integrity of the design and contact of the original investigation. A study is more likely to be replicated if it is rigorous. So later on in the lecture, we will show examples where even if something is um, replicable, if the design is not rigorous, you still get to the same conclusions which are not necessarily correct. So this diagram is meant to um, connect these terms. Transparency of reporting, uh, it's about um, the reporting of the study, the paper, the final report. Rigor of the study is more related to the design and the methods that you use to reach those conclusions. So transparency leads to reproducibility and rigor leads to replicability. Why have these issues become so important to NIH? Um, although there is very limited data, the data that uh, is published gets a lot of attention that um, criticize that scientific findings cannot be believed because there are flaws in the design or there are studies later on that refute the primary studies. Um, this has emerged in the preclinical setting where it seems to be an open secret that preclinical laboratory findings regarding drug targets are frequently inaccurate. This has led to a lot of articles in the lay press questioning the validity of scientific findings. Um, this has led to the initiatives such as the reproducibility project, and we're going to show examples of how they conduct a replication of prominent scientific findings to see if they can reproduce them. <clears throat> 
So this study was um, um, by Bayer, and they um, aim to validate projects within their company based on exciting published data. Um, and uh, the author reviewed results from internal validation studies. They included 67 projects and 47 from oncology. They found inconsistencies between published and in-house uh, data in two-thirds of the experiment. Collins and Tabak in Nature 2014 um, try to explain that it's a complex system, that it's not easy to have reproducibility in biomedical research, and contributing factors are the poor training, and papers again and again focus in training of researchers in experimental design, emphasis on not making provocative statements or exaggerating statements, and that um, um, publications that do not report basic elements of experimental design. So the details that we omit, especially since we have to make the paper shorter when we report our findings. So there are a lot of discussions about policies and attitudes of funding agencies, academic centers, and publishers. And there is kind of agreement that, um, of course, Usually the papers that get the scrutiny are the high-profile papers, high-profile journals, and um, there are no incentives for us as researchers to spend time and effort, usually unfunded obviously, to um, validate somebody else's findings. And this is not going to help you with promotion and tenure. So especially in the preclinical research where we're dealing with animal models, um, there are their reproducibility issues. So in all these um, um, scientific reports of uh, how can we improve the um, uh, transparency and re reproducibility, of course, we also see discussions about pressures and incentives, both from the scientists, the institutions, and the journal. Um, there are discussions of whether we exaggerate findings or whether we're too close to the hypothesis that we're testing. So we are trying to interpret the results in a way that it's not the most um, objective or unbiased. And the incentives, again, for promotion and recognition uh, gets, gets us back to this loop. So a paper by Alberts and all in science um, gave a more positive commentary from a group um, of the National Academy of Science and emphasized the fact that the media give suspect science equal play with substantive discoveries when obviously the two are not on the same play field. Um, in science, as opposed to other fields, errors are systematically criticized and fairly corrected because we build on other people's uh, findings and hypotheses. Um, in reality, scientific self-correction works most effectively for prominent, potentially path-breaking discoveries. The less efficient, more um, uh, less prominent findings are usually not uh, going back to validate it, but they're important because they're built on other hypotheses. So coming back to um, the scientific feedback, um, we have the discovery where we have many hypotheses or hypotheses generating experiments. Then we have a transparent publication. Um, sometimes we have replication experiments which can either confirm or refute. And then we amend the, the theory or the initial hypothesis if we find that it was not proven. But what are the, the logistical problems that we encounter? Most scientific advances are not path-breaking. So as we discussed earlier, the erroneous results that linger over time might not um, come back until 20 years or later to reevaluate them. Um, there is no transparency, and sometimes, often, is because we really have to shorten the report to very few patients and omit some details which we also think that are uh, obvious to others. Um, then we have the replication experiments are definitely costly in efforts and resources, and there is usually no funding to support such validation studies, and there is definitely poor reward and culture for criticizing somebody else's work and um, trying to prove that they're wrong. I, I, the common expression in the field is that you don't make friends by validating or refuting other people's work. But it's an essential part of our research here, especially when the more we dig, usually the more we find problems. So I will go through a few examples just to show what can go wrong, and then more examples will come at the second part of the lecture. 
Um, this study is now um, uh, old in the sense that um, it started in 2002. It was an original article published in The Lancet. Um, it identified a serum screening test for ovarian cancer. Um, it was a highly publicized controversy um, it, because th there was a paper followed by Baggerly and all in bioinformatics in 2004 that challenged and debated the multiple um, uh, steps that led to Petri Coin and all come up to this um, result. Uh, although there were a series of papers, and I was looking for more than an hour uh, last night, um, I will only focus on what Baggerly uh, found as problematic as opposed to what went on between 2002 and 2005 when all this was going on. Um, it's an example highlighting the issue of reproducibility. So ovarian cancer has a high mortality, ba mainly because it's typically detected at an incurable advanced stage. Um, the only measure now being used is CA125, and, uh, a biomarker, and to give you a, a marker, an idea, it has about 10 to 20 percent positive predictive value. It's a, uh, so a convenient, highly accurate screening test will be hugely valuable in this uh, cancer. Um, the investigators, Petriconi and al, used the uh, Celtitoid mass spectrometry to characterize the protein spectra of ovarian cancer patients and healthy controls. Sorry, I'll look at my notes. So um, that was a surface enhanced um, laser desorption ionization protein mass spectra from serum. So they had quite a big sample size and a sophisticated pattern recognition algorithm to find the optimal signal to distinguish cases, patients with ovarian cancer and controls. Also, they had low-stage and high-stage cancer patients. They reported a sensitivity of 100%, which, as you can imagine, is suspicious, um, that all 50 ovarian cases were correctly identified and specificity of 95%. 63 of 66 controls correctly classified as normal. Um, it, it, they were stunning results. They received a lot of press, especially because they had uh, early stage patients in their database. I will not go through the details. They're very technical, to, um, and they involve many steps. But this is the major figure from their paper, the original paper. You have mass charge and relative intensity, and they identified these uh, eight peaks, and they're um, separating cases and controls based on this clustering. Uh, they chose hundreds of small subsets of key values along the spectrum. And um, the set that best discriminates cases and controls in a training data set was selected and then validated on a randomly selected uh, test data set f independently from 50 cases and 66 controls. So when you read the paper in the Lancet, uh, you cannot imagine anything going wrong. They, they were very transparent. They outlined the patient population, the training data set, the validation data set, the algorithm, um, especially as uh, I was preparing for this lecture, I always go back and think, how did the reviewers miss that? But the papers are very well written, very well reported. So um, because of the 100% uh, sensitivity, um, this received a lot of attention, and Baggerly and all, um, a team of uh, bioinformatics group from MD Anderson, uh, spent two years reanalyzing the data. The data were available online. And before they published this paper, they also went to multiple conferences and were reporting all the things or the steps or assumptions that they were doing along the way to try to reproduce the results which were not uh, able to reproduce. Um, they use the same exact data set, and they also analyzed additional data from the website, um, a data set that consisted of exactly the same 216 samples, analyzing using a different array. So that will permit them to evaluate the reproducibility of the laboratory method. And another data set containing new cases and controls, uh, as we talked earlier, using the same data set, using a new data set, allowing an entirely new evaluation of the statistical method with a new training and test data set. Um, again, the paper uh, of Baggerly and Dahl is detailed. It goes pages by pages of why they think they cannot reproduce the results. But there were three major issues. One was whether they were baseline subtracted data versus not, and uh, the ones that they reported online versus the ones they used. 
So this baseline subtracted issue was going on. It was a common thing. And it's not the same thing as normalization. The normalization technique was interacting with the baseline subtracted data. So there were too many things that were uncertain here. That was one reason they could not reproduce the calculations. Data artifacts suggest that the specimens were not run on the same batch or randomly on multiple bunches as claimed in the original article. So they showed some um, uh, data to prove that they assumed that there was an experimental design um, that changed over time. And then analysis of new data using the proposed methods failed to produce the consistent clustering patterns that would lead to high accuracy, just the one that was uh, reported. So they suggest that the statistical method does not work as promised. So this is a heat map, uh, again, from the um, replication study. And they argue that this break at the benign disease uh, in data set one and the similarity of the profiles to those in data two suggests that a change in protocol occurred in the middle of the first experiment. And again, they go in details of what they think that is. And then this figure, they show the separation between cancer spectra and normal spectra and the Euclidean distance that was used as claimed by the original authors using the five peaks identified on data two. And the structure is effectively random, and there is no clear separation between cancers and normals. The data set two peaks do not separate data set three well. So what are the take home messages? The data made public do not appear to be in the format used in the publication, possibly due to ambiguities about whether they were normalized first or they were baseline subtracted. RA artifacts suggest that the laboratory experiment was not conducted as described, batch effects that were not randomly distributed. So this will affect the reproducibility because they're using the same data set and uh, they're trying to use the same methods, but they cannot match the methods. Replicability is when they went to a new data set, high accuracy of the pattern recognition method could not be replicated when the method was applied to an entirely new training and test data set. So, Again, the debate was going on for many years. The Lancet paper is not retracted because the authors rebutted and explained this is going on for pages with many technical details. But you do not work, you do not want your work subject to this kind of public scrutiny. And um, I, definitely this serum is not being used now in ovarian cancer to detect um, uh, cancer. So uh, changing gears now, replicability, um, and, uh, and reproducibility was addressed by the Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology. It was a collaboration between Science Exchange and the Center for Open Science, independently replicating experiments from high profile papers. The goal was to replicate the findings independently. They will repeat the experiments to see if the same conclusions are reached. And again, based on our definitions, this addresses replicability. Results from these projects are, um, are in different fields, but I will show you only two examples where, where the original study was reproduced and where, where, where there was not. So the examples were chosen because the data, the protocols, the methods of analysis, and detailed step-by-step -step reasons why the results were not the same, different, or the same, or close in direction and magnitude are detailed in these reports if you want to go back and look. So the first example is um, the hypothesis is that this novel peptide IRGD enhances the penetrance of chemotherapy doxorubicin beyond the vasculature. So the original report was Sukara and all in science, and the replication study was Mantis et al. Uh, in um, the journal called eLife. Uh, they attempted to replicate four findings. And um, as you, um, uh, this was in mice, so they have two groups, the doxorubicin alone and the doxorubicin plus this novel peptide. So they have four key endpoints or outcomes, doxorubicin accumulation in tumor tissue, tumor weight of the mice, body weight shift of the mice, and tunnel staining measured uh, of apoptosis. So these A, B, C, D um, outcomes will be presented in the next slide. So you can see here these a, a four outcomes, and you can see on the zero, close to the zero uh, line, the treatment effect um, as measured by the replication study. So it's denoted here by RP. Replication study is here, the second line. 
The first line is the original study. And you can see, because it's not close to the zero line, there was an effect here that was not replicated. There was an effect that it wasn't replicated. Uh, there was no effect, and it was in a different mag magnitude and direction. And here, it wasn't replicated. The paper also shows a meta-analysis, which I didn't present because it's complicated to go into the details. But all of these reports that I'll show you, they uh, include a meta-analysis where they usually re uh, report both studies or studies that they can find to see which one of the two is the truth, right? Because we don't know what is the underlying truth. But in this example, all four experiments were uh, refuted. The second example is, um, again, from animal studies. Here, the hypothesis is that multiple myeloma um, uh, and this small molecular inhibitor JQ1 will inhibit transcription. The original study was um, investigating whether this inhibition as a therapeutic strategy to target C MYC is uh, feasible, and the study was reported by Delmore and al. in cell. Um, they, they had several randomized groups, and they were comparing JQ1, the original study, to vehicle control in 10 mice. In the replication study, though, they included an additional um, experimental group, um, which here is denoted as JQ minus minus in this figure here. It's the blue line. Um, and that was um, served as an additional control to evaluate the specificity of this approach. So just think about the original study had these two groups, the control versus not, and this had the three groups. And I don't show the p-values of the second experiment because they had more groups, so they had uh, a correction for multiple comparisons, so they had corrected and uncorrected p-values. But generally speaking, they were reproduced because they showed that the effect still exists is significant if you compare the red line with the black line. And um, they came close to the median survival in the control group. It was 24 versus 22 days in the original versus replication study. In the treated group, it was 36 days in the original study, but in the replication study, it was not reached, because you can see they still survive here and they go. And um, they go on discussing also how about if they evaluate tumor burden as an outcome, and the two studies were different about um, how they euthanized due to mice due to disease progression, and so, they had differences about the time point of 22 days, whether they reached that time point or not. And they also discuss factors that affect the assessment of tumor growth and that you can find different results from study to study, depth and location of tumor, route of administration, timing of image, and longitudinal monitoring. So it's good that they acknowledge all of that, and the point of this is that uh, any replication study might not do exactly the same thing because it's an opportunity to test new hypotheses along with validating the previous. Um, finally, this is um, a, a big report by the psychological science, so I'm moving on to a different topic. And they had uh, this uh, paper in Science in 2015. They tried to replicate 100 prominent published experimental and correlational studies in the field of psychology. They, they selected published studies from three major psychology journals, and they wanted to follow the original study protocol as uh, close as possible and compare the original and replication studies with respect to statistical significance so usually p-value and whether you reach the same conclusion and magnitude of the effects observed. So this is an interesting study. On the x-axis, you see the original effect size. So if you look at this plot, it's cluster or it's around here, right? And then this the re replication effect size, and you can see that it's around zero. The grid dots show the statistically significant result in the replication experiment, and red dots show the non-significant. And also, as you can imagine, if they were in agreement, they would lie mostly on that line, this line here, if they were both in agreement. But you can see a number of them are in agreement, which are typically significant, and all of these are not in agreement, 
and the replication study found them to be zero, to have no effect. Also, the original experiments were mostly significant. Only four were not significant. And this um, will be discussed more in the next slide is uh, refer to publication bias, right? The results that are published are usually significant. So that's why all of these studies are significant. So the, this study received a lot of attention um, because it didn't reproduce the results because they don't lie on this 45-degree uh, line. Um, the conclusion was that maybe we're not doing a great job. But uh, the interpretation of, the, of this is that um, scientists sometimes can exaggerate findings or um, the natural tendency for applications is to have smaller effect size. Another point that we didn't um, cover here is that the circles show the power. So the big circles show 80% power or 90% power. So the fact that the second uh, study didn't find the effect, it was not due to lack of power. So um, the project, though, by definition, is influence, influenced by publication bias because the published studies that you're trying to replicate are um, usually reporting positive findings. So they're reporting a significant effect that you're trying to validate. And the... Um, Studies that show a negative effect are harder to find or not publish, so that's why this sample is heavily biased by uh, significant treatment effects. Also, um, we're not going to cover that today, but it's important that we don't know which one of these studies is the true. And in statistics, sometimes uh, we call this the gold standard, right? We are comparing two published methods. Let's say which one, is, which one is the gold standard to see which one of the methods is correct. So here, the fact that the replication effect found no difference, it doesn't mean that um, um, uh, there was difference and it was missed. So going back to the NIH rules, um, again, there are uh, websites and uh, the grand... Um, the grant administrators are better um, updated to update you on this as they change. But there are four key areas that applicants must address explicitly. Scientific premise of the research, scientific rigor, consideration of biological variables, and authentication of key biological and or chemical resources. So we all know that we have a significant section, and here we should contain background on why the work you plan is relevant in the context of ongoing work in the field. In this significant section, um, the NIH wants a precise, explicit statement of the scientific hypothesis that you propose to evaluate. Um, they also want critical appraisal of the scientific rigor of the previous studies the studies that you report by others in the background that have led to you forming this current hypothesis. The most important thing is to accomplish this by actually have a clearly articulated scientific premise or hypothesis. And although this generally applies to grants that involve scientific experiments to test hypotheses, it's unclear that it's relevant for grant applications that test new methodology. But you will be surprised as a statistician how many times I get a grant and there is no hypothesis. I'm looking and looking and thinking, am I missing something? And I'm only looking for, is right some kind of X affect Y? Of course, I mean, that can come later. But the, the hypothesis of, is some kind of intervention, is some kind of um, 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 effect on some outcome? And sometimes it's very hard to articulate in concise and non-technical words this uh, hypothesis. Um, from the NIH website, I quote, the strict application of the scientific method to ensure robust and unbiased experimental design, methodology, analysis, interpretation, and reporting of the results. This includes full transparency in reporting experimental detail so uh, that others may reproduce the extent of the findings. Um, and now we're going to the scientific rigor. Um, consideration of relevant biologic variables. 
Um, again, this is from the NIH website. Biological variables such as sex, age, weight, and underlying health conditions that are often critical factors affecting health or disease. In particular, sex is a biologic variable that is frequently ignored in animal study designs and analysis, leading to an incomplete understanding of potential sex-based difference in basic biological function. NIH expects that sex as a biological variable will be factored into research designs, analysis, and reporting in animal and human studies. Strong justification from the scientific literature, preliminary data, or other relevant considerations must be provided for applications proposing to study only one sex. These issues pertain to scientific rigor and should be addressed in the approach. So even when I apply for grants that evaluate a new statistical method where I don't include any human subjects, I have to include why this is not applicable. Um, authentication of key biological and or chemical resources. This includes cell lines, specialty chemicals, antibodies, and other biologics. The authentication is not part of the 12 or 6, depending on the grant application, page grant limit. It's a separate one-page document. Um, you need to show evidence why you believe the biological and or chemical resources you are planning to use are capable of providing the quality of results that you need. Note this section is required for established resources, how you plan to handle, validate new cell lines, animal models, antibodies should be detailed in the research plan of the proposal. So I will guarantee you that we have gr great resources, meaning if you ask your mentor or somebody in your lab or anyone that you work with, they usually have um, a, a page or more to um, guide you on what to use. And I had uh, grants being rejected, but uh, not for these reasons. On these reasons, we usually get um, the highest scores, environment and scientific expertise. So coming back to um, websites, um, y here you can find more details. Uh, refer to published guidelines if, you, uh, if they apply in your setting. For antibodies, you have to show that you can and will run all appropriate controls, how you will test new budgets and lots. Cell lines, convince the reviewers that you can unequivocally demonstrate that the cells you're working on are what you think they are and drugs and chemicals discuss how purity of the compounds will be assured. So going into the rigor of the experimental design, which of course this is more um, uh, extensive, and we're not gonna go into details here because it depends on the specific hypothesis and question you're addressing. Uh, there are some general principles. So for example, when we submit a PO1, a lot of the design of experiments applies to multiple projects. So we have standard language for phase one, phase two, phase three studies, animal experiments, animal experiments that are following mice for tumor growth, survival. These are pretty standard, but we still have to outline specifically what are the groups, what are the outcomes, what are you comparing, how many, why do you need that many, and so forth. Um, you also need to address transparency in the reporting of the results. Um, there is a, a number of tools that you can choose from statistical methods, again, depending on the question. Um, the best advice that we can give is to get uh, advice from a statistician. We're going to give some examples in, in the second half of the talk, but again, we're not going to go into details of how to do the analysis. There is a basic course on introductory statistics. Um, and is led by Drs. Jaya Sadakopan and Sujara Padel. If you contact the uh, Office of Scientific Education and Training, you can get information on the syllabus and registration. Um, there are useful courses available on, online, and uh, we also have a biostatistics core helpline if your specific lab or specific disease indication doesn't have a, a, a statistician assigned to it then we have a consulting group where you can email and get uh, information. And as you can imagine, the earlier the better. If you contact and you say, I need this by tomorrow, it, it will not be done. So um, general study design principles. Um, again, many planned studies built around a specific experimental contrast, a hypothesis, a question. Um, we have to state this explicitly. We have to give put, um, attention to potential sources of bias. This is where statisticians or somebody external to your group can see the biases more clearly. Randomization 
uh, is meant to eliminate biases, but is not required and is not feasible for all the studies. Um, of course, the chance that you will reach the correct conclusion depends on the sample size, and we, I will just define power, statistical power, um, in terms of how many units, patients, mice, or other experimental units, do you need to come to a significant conclusion or to detect a certain treatment effect? So what is a power calculation? Um, again, the goal is to um, make sure that the study, the way you designed it, if you assign 10 patients or 12 or 6 per group, is capable of addressing the study hypothesis with some acceptable sensitivity or, or precision or accuracy. Uh, we have to um, uh, specify what tests we're going to use to answer this hypothesis and, of course, the outcome and the variables measured. The, um, Sample size calculation depends on the magnitude of the effect of the outcome. So you, this is usually a treatment effect. Um, and it depends not only on the effect, on the point estimate, but on the variance, right? And power is the probability that you will obtain a statistically significant result. You will find the effect given that the effect exists. So again, this probability given that the effect exists usually is quantified. So if you have um, a response rate, let's say 30% response rate versus 50% response rate, or median survival of five months versus 10 months. Um, sometimes this effect size is, is quantified using odds ratio, hazard ratio. It depends on the outcome. I'm just giving some general uh, statistics that are used. So in order to calculate power, we need the effect size. We need um, some estimate of the variance. And um, it depends, again, if it's a two group or if you are comparing with a historical control. You also sometimes hear the term minimum detectable effect. So the study can, affect, uh, the study can detect an effect of this size or larger. And often in animal studies and in grants, we are able to affect very large effects. That's why we have very small studies, because they are the first studies or they're trying to prove something early on before we build newer or bigger experiments. So um, the, the idea here is that if you're not sure um, if this is clinically meaningful, we can provide a, 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 an array of values. So we can say you can um, detect this effect if this is the, the standard deviation or this effect if this is a standard deviation. And again, it depends how much preliminary data you have and how comfortable you have with that preliminary data, which sometimes is not the case. So coming back to sex and other biological variables, um, if you're comparing two groups, and especially in a non-randomized experiment, we want to be sure that the groups are comparable in, in terms of uh, baseline characteristics or any other factors that can affect the um, intervention or contrast under investigation. Um, you want to also make sure that your population is uh, generalizable, that these results that you find here are applicable to different populations. And um, that's why selection, eligibility criteria, which again, we will go into details later with examples, who do you include, who do you exclude, will affect the results and how generalizable the results are. Um, in a grant application, it's good to acknowledge that you recognize these concerns and indicate a rationale of how you selected the experimental units or the patient population. Okay, so let's say we designed the experiment and we have a statistical test and we got a p-value. A p-value is only valid in the context of a single precisely defined experiment. Um, if you try many, many tests, which is uh, the problem of multiple testes, uh, testing or um, multiple comparisons, then the more you look, the more you find. So this is a well-defined um, um, problem in statistics. You have to correct for the fact that you um, performed many tests to take into account that some of the significant results that you found might be result of um, randomness. So this is a cartoon to show how um, science in, in the medical news is portrayed, that you have a number of factors 
and then you might um, argue that can cause uh, a certain disease and then you try to interpret in which patient populations or subgroups or um, um, populations this relates to. So these are the factors that influence replicability. Um, imprecise specification of the intervention and study contrast. Imprecise specification of the outcome or condition, and that's what that cartoon was showing. That if you're trying many outcomes, many hypotheses, you will find something. And imprecise specification of the experimental units and or study population. Elective exclusion of data points from the analysis. So defining clearly before the experiment starts what is the population of interest and why. So these are two, um, I, I think, useful examples from the NIH website. Uh, I will give you some time to read. Um, they describe experiments in male and female mice, randomly allocated to experimental groups. Um, they describe the compound at three doses for four weeks compared to the control. IP administration will be used to indicate a clear preference for the, um, for the IV route, a group size of 10 and a power of 90% to detect a 22% reduction of the um, CUG repeat RNA in quantracibes muscle by QRT-PCR, and they show the test. So here they report the effect size, 22% reduction in this um, um, outcome, CUG. Sample size of 10 mice, power 90%. Um, so this is, relatively speaking, a well-written um, justification and description. But somebody could argue that 22% is a strange effect size. So sometimes this comes from the fact that you first select the sample size, 10, and you fix the, sample, the power, 90%, and then you find this effect size. For human studies, for sure, you have to uh, cite other pilot studies or other type of studies, maybe preclinical studies, to justify why you selected that treatment effect or why you selected the historical control and why you think you're expecting an 30 or 50 percent improvement. Um, also, this experiment describes three doses, but then in the description, the, it's not clear whether you're going to combine them or you're going to do a dose, you are going to analyze them separately for each dose. And um, some more details could outline the, the experiment further. This is another example from the NIH website. Uh, signal data will be transformed into log values and then modeled by longitudinal methods. The composite difference in mean intensity signals over time between those two groups is assumed to be 2.8 logs with a composite standard deviation of 2.2 logs. Five repeated measures per mouse after T cell infusion and a within mouse intracorrelation coefficient equal to 0.5. A sample size of 10 mice per group will provide at least 80% power to detect the above difference between treated versus control group with a 5% significance level. And then a test will be used to compare the survival distribution. So here, not only they showed us the treatment effect, um, but also they showed us the standard deviation of 2.2 logs. They also uh, are articulate that they have correlated repeated measures. So because they are measuring the same mouse over time, there is an intra-mouse, within mouse intra-correlation coefficient, and they list it. And in order to do a proper car power calculation here, when you have repeated measurements over time, you do have to ac account for this correlation because the mice are no longer independent. Test to be used is cited, although that's for a different uh, outcome, the survival group. So again, this, is, um, um, this shows that it was well thought out and the variables that were needed or the parameters are, are well um, defined. The scientific method um, is defined as a method that involves making conjectures. 
A hypothesis is a conjecture based on knowledge obtained while formulating the question. The hypothesis might be very specific or it might be broad. Scientists then test hypotheses by conducting experiments. A scientific hypothesis must be falsifiable, implying that it is possible to identify a possible outcome of an experiment that conflicts with predictions deducted from the hypothesis. Otherwise, the hypothesis cannot be meaningful. The reason that I show that is because um, we have to define what is a scientific method. Um, it is a crucial part of the process to make conjectures. Uh, it's a creative aspect of science. You can explore many hypotheses, and usually this is called hypothesis generating, where you have data. It can be from one experiment or multiple sources or multiple studies, and you're testing different hypotheses to see what is the underlying biological truth. Um, the guidelines focus specifically on hypothesis testing and not hypothesis generating. When reporting results, it's important to be forthright and transparent if you're really reporting hypothesis generating. And this goes back to the multiple comparisons, multiple hypotheses um, problem that I described. If your analysis um, involves many uh, hypotheses or analyses or different methods that were evaluated, then the reported results should acknowledge that um, because then it's obvious that there is some randomness in terms of what is um, true, positive, or um, false positive. So coming back to um, our debating whether the scientific paper is a fraud, um, there is really a plea for transparency because uh, the idea is that we're not doing just a series of steps, but um, um, we're, doing we're doing a very disjointed process of um, many different questions and hypotheses that along the way that we could have um, a false start or a false hypothesis. Um, and because we trim the reporting papers to present the conclusions and the results and the implications for future studies, um, we don't properly articulate and transmit the degree of uncertainty behind each one of these tests that we did. So coming back to this um, diagram, which um, it's very um, telling actually, um, the preclinical or the process of scientific discovery was mostly captured by this um, panel here, that we explore um, multiple sources, multiple hypotheses. We are changing our hypotheses and models I, as we go along, and we publish some of it because we cannot publish all of this uh, evolution of hypotheses. And this is perfectly fine in the process of scientific discovery and um, um, cre creativity. In the scientific method, conventionally defined, and usually this is more prominent in the clinical trial setting, is that you have a precise hypothesis, you have a specific protocol to test this hypothesis. And this protocol, by definition, it's outlining clearly who is going to be included, the eligibility, what are the methods, and what are the analyses. And the idea here is to minimize bias so that you can really conduct the study and at the end of the day say it was only the intervention or the hypothesis that affected this outcome, not other external biases. So following this pre-specified data analysis plan and design and then leading to transparent pu publication, this is how usually clinical trials are um, conducted and reported and this is the scientific method as conventionally defined. So publishing, um, most journals, as we know, use this um, idea of having the four sections, introduction, methods, results, discussion. Uh, there are a lot of uh, guidelines as a um, push for more transparency, concert diagram, who is going to be included, excluded and why. And um, it's, usually, it's used mostly in clinical and epidemiological guidelines. Arrive guidelines for animal experiments, and um, many journals support um, many of these guidelines so that they're standardized and you can have the resources to go and look so that the papers are also um, 
more similar and you can compare between studies. Um, obviously, we want transparent uh, papers in reporting what was actually done. Um, and these uh, guidelines are meant to achieve that. Um, some journals, they require the raw data. There is more uh, push for that, but not all of the journals are um, pushing for that. For the genomics data, this is kind of um, standard. Uh, extensive sampling elementary methods, especially with online, you can now include more details about the methods, the exclusions. And in the clinical trial setting, um, um, obviously in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, there are um, guidelines, um, they're not guidelines, it's mandatory to prospectively register clinical trials in databases such as clinicaltrials.gov, where you have to outline the sample size, the hypothesis, eligibility, so that patients and researchers can have access to what trials are ongoing and um, which ones are close to um, finish accrual. All these efforts are designed to make the scientific work transparent and so that they can make a true progress in the field by knowing what's, um, what is going on. So to wrap up for the first part of the talk, and then we will have a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back to more examples. Um, this talk was motivated by the new uh, NIH record and reproducibility rules. Uh, generally, though, is, uh, the, is describing the new landscape of scientific contact. Um, the new rules seem to be more targeted at preclinical research, and um, in terms of designing research studies, the goal is to encourage work that is likely to be correct. In other words, if uh, different scientists try to replicate the results, they will come to the same conclusions. They also obviously want rigorous studies so that the funding um, was well spent in, try in terms of uh, answering the scientific objective. They want to minimize that bias. Some, they, they want to have studies that um, are designed with a sample size sufficiently large to minimize the impact of statistical fluctuations and um, selection of methods that are valid. In terms of transparency, um, I, I would just re summarize that the, re the findings have to be transparently reported. Um, there are problems in terms of excluding data points animals or otherwise um, patients that do not fit the theory, and we're going to show examples shortly, or using different hypotheses, tests, and endpoints, but selecting only a subset. The checklists are meant to be very helpful, and again, when you read the literature from previous reports, you can also assess the ambiguities and bias yourself. And if you want to look at other studies uh, to understand the methods by using the raw data, this is more um, increasingly available. Um, there are obviously caveats, especially since journals are minimizing the number of pages, and um, reporting an experiment concisely is very challenging. So the idea here is that we want to encourage other scientists to um, build on true hypotheses and not on, on wrong um, leads. And that is the way we're going to um, um, lose efficiency in the process. There are career pressures in terms of um, competing for grants, publishing, and publishing in prominent journals. Uh, but again, having um, d different collaborators looking at the same results will help you interpret the results in a more unbiased way. And the idea is that the regulators now try to make sure that we are discouraged from supporting our hypothesis at the expense of the truth or exaggerate the results. And at the bottom, the bottom line is that this relies on personal integrity. Thank you. So any questions? No questions. We're going to have a 10-minute break, and then we're going to show specific examples from animal studies, a clinical trial, and, um, and, and some genetics data.
Um, I will start with the examples until we get somebody to play this video. So until now, most of the definitions, obviously, um, and the requirements were from the NIH website. I didn't give you any of my viewpoints. Um, I worked previously in the industry for Bristol Myers Squibb and obviously now for 15 years here in academia. I have editorial positions at the Journal of Clinical Oncology and Clinical Trials, and I'm a reviewer and committee member for NIH and ASCO for the grants committees. I used to be. And the Research Council is a committee here at Memorial that reviews protocols for scientific integrity. And previously, I was a member of the Data Safety Monitoring Committee. So some, uh, this relate to the video, so I will skip. Um, some of the case studies that I'll show today, um, they, they were not analyzed the way I will describe. But all of those uh, examples that I'll show and the particular data steps that were taken, um, were, uh, we, we as statisticians are asked to do uh, many of those. The three examples include an animal um, example, a high dimensional data, and a clinical trial. And the point is to present the concepts and to provide advice on how to avoid common mistakes. So let's start with the animal data. We have. Um, um, criticism, as we talked earlier, about in vitro data differing from one lab to the other, but everybody has to work with animal at, at some point. And preclinical research, especially work that uses animal models, seems to be the most susceptible to reproducibility issues, according to this report. So this case study, um, it was in colon cancer. A CPT-11 was approved and um, an active control for treating colon cancer, and now this study was going to investigate the addition of HMR. HMR is the, an experimental CDK inhibitor. So we had uh, one control group, two monotherapy groups, and three combination groups where you got these uh, agents four, seven, and 11 hours apart. So you had six mice per group. And um, these P21 intact HCT116 xenografts in node mice. The hypothesis was HMR um, potentiates CPT11, which is the active control, if administered within a time delay. Tumor volume measured twice weekly is the outcome. So these are the days in the x axis and the tumor volume on the um, uh, y axis. You see the two controls here and of course the four uh, experimental groups. Okay. So CPT, um, since it's a, a positive control that we want to beat, we outlined from the beginning that we're gonna make these comparisons. Um, the combination treatments when they're given four, seven, 11 hours apart versus the control treatment, uh, which here is uh, the black line. No, here, sorry, here is, is the green line. So since we're looking at these uh, tumor measures over time, a typical test to use is the area under the curve that takes into account the whole longitudinal profile and um, not at a specific time point. So each of these groups will have a value that describes the area under the curve. It's a summary statistic, right? So if you take that value and you compare it with uh, these four groups, and the three comparisons, you have a p-value of 0 0.93, 0 0.27, 0 0.18, so they're all non-significant. But now, um, instead of looking at the whole entire longitudinal profile, let's just look at the um, specific time point. Let's say day 24. And over there, it looks like there is a big separation. So if we test the two groups at a specific time point, not over time, what do you find? You find a p-value of 0 0.09, uh, which is still not significant. So now we look at this um, group more closely. There are um, six mice, and um, we see there the average effect. And this um, black line, um, sorry, uh, th this is the same figure closer. We, by looking at this um, closely and looking at the, um, the average effect of these six and the control, somebody could say that black mice, mouse shouldn't belong here. So how about maybe it was labeled by mistake as belonging in that group, but it's more likely that um, uh, it was given only CPT-11.
in terms of measuring this uh, growth. So is it possible that injections were mixed and never got the investigational agent? And that's why it looks like a, a CPT alone group. So how, what happens if we exclude this mouse? If we exclude it, so we have the, um, the six group here and then the five group here, the effect, the summary value comes, becomes lower because that value was um, high and we excluded it. So now we do a test uh, on these two groups and the p-value is significant. Um, would this invite a critique? How was the 24-day um, time point was chosen? And is it a concern that uh, tumors um, rebound after 24 days? So how about we truncate the figure and now we just show up to 24 days. So what are the post-hoc decisions that happen here? Um, we did a lot of comparisons, but at the end we focused on this experimental group that was given seven days, seven hours. We performed two different statistical tests, one that takes the whole longitudinal and one that takes one time point. We optimized the second test by choosing the day with the maximal separation. We excluded an animal because it did not look like it received treatment, and we truncated the figure at the time point of maximal separation. I know it sounds extreme, but these things do happen. So how do these unusual strike you? Each of them is quite possible in itself, and yet their cumulative effect is certainly considerable. So these, um, again, were just used for illustration. The correct analysis was done, and it's uh, reported here. But uh, I, I chose this data to show how a decision at each time point about um, who to include and what uh, is the outcome measure and what is the test can affect the conclusions. Try it again. Okay, sure. I think, um, yes. Okay, let me just finish what is wrong with this example and then. So um, there is lack of transparency because not all the steps were reported. Um, the figure is truncated at 24 with no mention of subsequent data points. It seems like the experiment ended at that time point and the exclusion of an animal is not mentioned. It appears like this group was five uh, animals to begin with. And in terms of reproducibility, in if a, another a lab does this same experiment, let's say it was transparent, and um, what do you think will happen? If it includes all animals and uses the second test with um, a 24-hour tr truncation. So this re r raises concerns about reproducibility and um, the fact that we didn't choose the right time point using the, con the correct methods. There are methods in statistics that account for the fact that you looked and found the optimal um, test statistic. And in terms of uh, going back to transparency, a study is reported transparently if all inferential critical steps taken in the design, contact and analysis are reported fully and accurately. So we have here problems of reproducibility because of transparency. But we also have problems with replicability because if a new person gets new data trying to reproduce this experiment, this experiment was not rigorously designed, so it doesn't mean that the conclusions are, are correct. So I'll go back to the video. Oops. Okay. Sure. 
We, we can skip the video and continue. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, so this experiment though can also be used to show whether replication is feasible here. Suppose that all the steps were transparent and explained in a publication, and yet another lab replicated the treatment and found that the same treatment is good at a, the, a different time point after excluding one animal. Um, does, d d is the conclusion valid that um, um, the treatment works? So replication of an experiment which is not well designed or well analyzed, here both the design and the analysis are questionable, is not an indication of good science. Um, this is where rigor comes in, that um, rigor increases the chance of arriving at the correct conclusions, not just replicable ones. So this is going back to the previous um, um, diagram where reporting affects uh, transparency and reproducibility and design affects rigor and replicability. So the second example uh, relates to high dimensional data. Um, the example um, specifically, the aim of this research was to evaluate and identify unique exosome proteins in pancreatic duct fluid that may distinguish pancreatic duct ductal adenocarcinoma from intraductal pancreatic mucinous neoplasm or IPMN with microinvasion and benign pancreatic process. So here we have four groups of patients and because we have various proteins, we have 2,203 proteins in patients in the PDAC group 15, in the IPMN two groups four and five and benign, including pancreatitis and um, different other um, can cancer types there. So if you look at uh, the hypothesis again, um, is are these four groups or pancreatic diseases differential in terms of expression of exosome protein, which can be served as tumor marker to distinguish these pancreatic diseases? So if you look at the heat map and the four groups, there is no separation. If you look at the p-value, you can see that most of them are not significant with a very, very tiny fraction. Um, so hypothetically, let's assume that we get a message that says one sample from the cancer group, so one patient, um, significantly deviated from the others in the cancer group, as well of the samples that you listed as normals, and had results more likely the, the cancer group is also left out from the analysis. So one patient here provides multiple samples, right? So by removing their patient, uh, the results change quite a lot. So is this exclusion um, rigorous? Similar to the animal experiment, samples are excluded based on the data, not on actual evidence, and not on pre-specified decisions, and um, whether they were indeed labeled incorrectly. So it's not rigorous. And um, in this case, if we remove the relabeling and report the results as in this panel, if another group keeps the relabeling, there is a possibility that it will be glossed over. So if you show the, if you see the figures side by side, the two sound very different. Of course, I'm not going into the methods here in terms of multiple comparisons, um, continue, uh, correction for the multiple comparisons and the fact that the tests are correlated. Um, but this brings us to the point of which groups are we going to compare? All four, PDAC versus other versus benign versus one of the two. So you can see because we had four groups, we can have different um, hypotheses here and different comparisons. It is tempting to do all comparisons and highlight the most significant, but I have been emphasizing this all along, that the more tests we do, the more the higher the chance we will report some significant by chance. So such results are unlikely to be replicated downstream. What do both examples share? Data-dependent exclusions of experimental units 
ideally all data analytic decisions and that was um, actually nicely shown in the video but you can watch it um, online I think um, comparisons exclusions should be made before data and justified and documented um, so that other people can know how did you reach that um, sample uh, definition and finally all exclusions should be reported so the question of whether you need a study protocol or statistical analysis plan there should be a study protocol is not only required for um, um, clinical studies in a protocol you justify and pre-specify the methods any deviations from the protocol should be documented and it saves time both for future experiments and the current experiment electronic documentation these days I think is a uh, obviously preferable so how about if some uh, argue that these are preclinical and so we don't need a protocol uh, we only need a protocol in clinical trial because you're experimenting with human um, with humans it's too, certainly true for consent but for the methods it's 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 true that we need a protocol and um, the idea of the protocol is to specify the methods and and to design a study as rigorously as possible before you saw the data so you eliminate the bias and you design the study based on what you have known from other studies so the idea is that rigor um, is the highest um, in clinical trials because they are designed so specific with a specific hypothesis in mind and a specific patient population and so they have the highest level of evidence they um, prove or um, support or the other um, hypothesis that we have found from preclinical data definitively but even in clinical trials we can find problems and the field has shifted a lot so these are um, less frequently less frequent now but still they exist so the last example is from a um, clinical trial it's called PACE um, it was for chronic fatigue syndrome or known as myalgic encephalomyelitis 600 adults were randomized to four groups um, the outcomes were self-rated physical function in a um, validated scale self-rated fatigue and recovery so the four groups the study was reported in um, a journal and uh, these percentages here show the number of patients um, meeting the trial criteria for recovery uh, the first group is I think some cognitive behavior the second is exercise the third is adaptive and the fourth is um, standard of care so these are the four groups and you can see that a higher percentage of patients um, achieved recovery in the two arms as opposed to the other two so this study confirmed that recovery from um, CFS is possible and that these two treatments cognitive behavior and exercise are the therapies most likely to lead to recovery so this trial dominated clinical policy in the UK and other countries in both government funded healthcare and private medical insurance so it got a lot of attention because it was going to change the way um, these uh, patients were treated so what happened a reanalysis of the data done by this group and published a few years later looked at the protocol definition and the analysis definition and changes that happened throughout the trial through amendments so how this functional scale was defined in terms of what cutoff the Chalter scale in terms of what cutoff the clinical global impression in terms of eligibility and clinical definition of CFS so all of these combined affect the eligibility who is included in the study and the outcome measure how do you define success both are fundamental in a clinical trial and they were changed midway through the trial the definition of eligibility was um, transparently reported in the original report and sometimes it's common to change eligibility criteria to increase accrual you started a trial and you realize that it's very slow to accrue because uh, you cannot identify those patients obviously these considerations should have been done before 
but amendments are typically done to change eligibility criteria to make the trial um, more feasible. But then there is, of course, the challenge of how do you interpret the results when some of the patient population had certain eligibility criteria and some of it had different. So there was a lot of discussion about um, consent and conflict of interest and funding, and um, this received a lot of attention because if you follow the protocol definition versus the analysis definition, um, th you will find no difference in the four arms, and the first type of analysis was not um, validated. So the data were um, uh, given to the public after a lot of pressure by an independent research group, and that's how they were able to uh, recalculate. Um, this reanalysis documented what was already clear, that the claims of recovery could not be taken at face value. So the report by um, uh, Wilshire and al, which is the reanalysis, uh, came to the conclusion that these two experimental treatments are, are not in, uh, helping patients in terms of recovery, and they're not justified by the data. So um, there was a push to retract the original paper, and this is what followed. 12,000 patients and supported signed a petition for retraction. There was an open letter to the journal editors. All of this, of course, is available online. There was lack of transparency, they argue. Again, if you go back to the original paper, which I was lancet again, um, the amendments were there, the change in eligibility were there, but um, the change in outcome measure was not that clear. Lack of rigor in terms of the design, and changing the analysis uh, definitions based on the data. So there are reproducibility issues. The editor's response was that um, this is interesting that they found different results, but presumably interested parties will now be able to read this reanalysis and compare the scientific quality of the reanalysis with that of the original. My understanding is that this is the way that science advances. So, the latest that I could find, it's a whole investigation to find out what happens with these uh, papers, is uh, an hour long or more a parliament um, a debate, uh, which is available if you're interested, and it starts by really defining the patient population. So the, it's even arguable who is the patient population that are, they're trying to save here. Uh, but they concluded that this is the biggest medical scandal of this 21st century. So the point of this example is that even in clinical trials where human subjects are involved and we don't expect this kind of um, uh, mistakes, mistakes still happen. And there is a difference between uh, honest mistake when um, um, it happens versus manipulation of the data to give a much greater appearance of success. So an, a single isolated mistake can also always be explained and um, identified in a follow-up paper, but um, mi misconduct is a different thing and your reputation is on the line. So as I mentioned earlier, um, there is debate whether preclinical studies should be um, at the same standards as clinical studies because this is where we learn from the data. So we have to allow some scientific creativity. But we go back to this, um, um, definition of the scientific method. Uh, yes, there are um, m hypotheses and models that have to evolve over time and um, reach a, a particular conclusion based on that experimental um, investigation, but there is a difference between hypothesis generating and hypothesis testing. So, there are available guidelines, which I'm sure uh, you must know. They arrive guidelines um, for animal studies. They go on from the methods, introductions, to um, experimental animals and sample size. And we're going to zoom in here. Allocating animals to experimental groups. Again, it's incredible how many times I, I read a grant and I cannot find how many groups, how many animals. These are basic, and a reviewer shouldn't be spending time looking for these. 
experimental outcomes, what are you measuring, statistical methods, how are you going to test it, and why you're going to analyze 10 per group 12. And again, it's not always, be, be, you, will, you will not always be able to have good power, 90%. But um, it, it's okay to say, um, based on this number, you will have this much of uncertainty. Again, we have a biostatistics service, um, a number of statisticians. Usually, certain um, disease teams in the hospital are assigned the same biostatistician so that the biostatistician has expertise in that disease over time. If you don't have um, and you work in a various number of diseases, you can ask um, the biostats consulting group or um, somebody from your lab to connect you with the statistician. The library has um, enormous resources. I found a lot of um, policies, procedures, and guidelines in, in, the, in the library website, how to do systematic reviews, how to report. Um, Memorial also has a number of workshops on how to write grants, manuscripts, how to explain your research in Lehman terms. These are very useful. And um, if you have a question, I think the library is uh, happy to point you to the right uh, material online. I also found um, a presentation by Neil Ushma very uh, useful. Uh, she shared her experience, and some of it is documented in this paper here, about uh, the Journal of Clinical Investigation, how they had to make changes in the procedures and in the forms that authors sign so that they can... Um, ensure that you have institutional animal care and usage committee, IRB approval, um, authors had to sign forms, um, it's the last part here, to make sure that you're aware that you're submitted a, a, a paper and you're a co-author so that you cannot uh, say, I didn't know about this paper. This journal also has um, automatic now checks for figures, manipulation, plagiarism, um, checks if there is a biostats review and um, require supplemental figures and material to make sure that um, they have more than what is presented. The Journal of Clinical Oncology also has uh, quite um, some useful information online, how to write a paper. And um, recently, I think for a year now, all therapeutic intervention trials have to submit a protocol. It used to be that only randomized trials had to submit a protocol. And, and finally, I think, as uh, you know, when you start uh, trying to validate somebody else's work or replicate, you can spend much more time than what you had thought. So there are also guidelines here on authorship. If you think that you have to take more of a leadership role or credit for the work that you did. So um, RTM internal web page um, has a lot of uh, materials and presentations on education and training. And finally, a topic that I really, I mean, would like to discuss at a future date is data sharing. It's not, uh, as you know, mandatory by all journals, but the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors encourages it. Uh, they have uh, um, specific requirements for clinical trial registration, but for data, for data sharing is not uh, as explicit. You do have to have a data sharing statement, even if in that statement you say you're not going to share the data. Um, so MSK supports this uh, ISMG data sharing statement, and um, trials that begin enrollment of patients of January of 2019 must include a data sharing plan. Um, changes after registration should be reflected. And uh, a statements like undecided is not unacceptable. But as you can imagine, it's not um, easy to share the identified participant data, what data you're going to share, when, and um, how long after the publication, and what mechanism you're going to have to review proposals for requests for data. Um, so this is a Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center um, uh, statement on data sharing, protocol summary, statistical summary, and informed consent. This is for clinical trials, will be available online. 
um, and requests for de-identified individual participant data can be made within this time frame. Any questions? No questions? Well, thank you all for coming. And um, as I said, the NIH website has a lot of um, resources as well as the Memorial internal website. Thank you.